training for bouldering. You're training for bouldering. You just go, that was ridiculous. I mean, the concept of training for bouldering was just uh, absurd. If you've got one move and it's really obvious how to do that move, no matter how long you try it, there's no technique or rehearsal or anything, you have to get stronger to do that move. If you want to be a good climber, you have to climb a lot. For me, I think the most important thing is variety and changing where you climb. I started climbing at school when I was 15 years old and I went to a, a boarding school in Landudno in Wales and uh, we had a climbing club there every Wednesday and Saturday afternoon and we used to go to um, Snowdonia and climb in the Lamberis Pass. I am uh, Martin Mulbrotten. Uh, I started climbing together with Stian. I think I was 14 and he was uh, 13. It was something about the social aspect of it that really attracted me, uh, away from all other sports that I've been doing previously. So it was something more to climbing than to any other sport that I had encountered. We climbed a lot of competitions when we were younger. So we did like both the national competitions and the internationals. I started coaching the Norwegian national team in climbing. So I did that for five years and sort of built the foundation on how to write these books that we ended up writing, basically, to combine the best from, from the outdoors and the experience into the sort of like training for climbing scene. The attraction of the outdoor climbing is mainly the adventure for me, to go somewhere and see somewhere new, uh, but also like the um, puzzle of solving a boulder. This is what we want, huh? When we went to Stanich now on Sunday, we didn't see the films before we went there. We didn't like check out uh, certain boulders that we wanted to try, uh, just to have the full experience of trying to solve the puzzle that is a boulder problem. Classic boulder. If you think when we went to Stanage, there wasn't one problem without grass under it. Not one. Every single one had grass under it. You know, you can't imagine it now. It was, nobody went up there bouldering. We never thought any big deal about it, really. You just go up there and you'd always do your boulder problem. Come on. No, it's oh, funny. Oh, oh. <laughs> ah! Ah! Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I took a bit of skin. Huh? As to being out there and discussing the boulders and finding a solution together. And maybe it's a bit different for him than for me. Maybe we need to adjust it. I do it for my height and my strengths and he does it for his. But I think that's the main attraction, really. Oh, I'm actually doing boulders. It's so fun. <laughs> nice. A long time ago, we didn't really climb up there because you couldn't get there, so it was really hard to get there. When I did Ulysses, I had to get the bus through Cross Pool just before the Sportsman pub. So then I had to walk from the Sportsman all the way over the top down to Ulysses because we didn't have a car. So, I mean, it, that's, a, that's a bloody long walk uh, with all your climbing gear. I think I was maybe 21 or something when I did that. And 
you know, no bouldering mats. I think I top roped it 10 times and they thought, oh, that's enough. I don't want to do it too much because I don't want to get slapped off for, for practicing it too much. And I was just there with my mate and soloed it. Be thinking, God, if I'd fallen off it, there's no mobiles, nobody on the crag. No, you need to think, well, what would I have done? You know, you're screwed, aren't you? <laughs> you, know, you never think of, you never think about those things. And I did this one called Jericho Road. Okay, you go out right. Travis. You know, even when we developed uh, Crag X and we were doing loads of problems on Stanage and all over the place, you never thought that you'd never do a problem and write to a magazine. It never had any publicity. And, you know, the thought of there being a guidebook for bouldering was ridiculous. You never thought it would happen. You never thought people would go bouldering. We just went bouldering and, and did problems then and gave it a name. And then you'd go there a couple of weeks later and you forgot what you called it, you know. You, you wouldn't remember it. This is called the Hulk. Where you start on that pinch, it's a standing start. Yeah. And then this one is called Superman Meets the Hulk. <laughs> and a big battle of power. <laughs> <laughs> Once you've got it into a crib like that, very good. Machine is nice. Machine last girl. Yeah, once you've got that, you know, something that goes. Yeah. <laughs> and then you already done it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's not opening. It's not opening now. <laughs> Can't really have to try those oh, anymore. I have a, a very flat. <laughs> I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy. If you have a real hard power move, it's just going to stop people. And I wanted to do problems that nobody else could do. I wanted to do the hardest problems. And I feel if you've got a Travis or you've got a long problem with 12 moves, if you work it and work it and work it, that you're just going to work it in submission and it's going to get easier. If you've got one move and it's really obvious how to do that move, it doesn't matter how long you try it, there's no technique or rehearse or anything. You have to get stronger to do that move. So I just figured it, it's just more of a test to have one really hard move. And nowadays people can go back and you know, do the moves that I was doing 20, 30 years ago and think, well, that's how strong he was. Not how, you know, this is how long he spends on it. When I did the Joker, just, just the single move, it was a beautiful morning. It was blue sky, the ground was frozen. I went out there at seven o'clock and I, I thought, I've got to go out there, get perfect conditions. There was one other guy on the crag and he was over on the far bit where not to be taken away. And I walked across and said, look, I'm trying this problem. Can you spot me? And he came across 
and spotted me. And I did it, I bet I did it probably, you know, half seven, quarter to eight on, on, on a weekend morning. And it was just, it, it was just perfect, perfect conditions. I, I'll never forget the day. Yeah, it was a long time ago. When I first started trying that, it was before bouldering mats. You know what I mean? I, I, I had uh, no bouldering mat. I remember bringing out a cushion, thinking, I wonder if that'll help. And I was trying it by myself with no spot at all. I was hitting that thing and then like turning, sort of kind of landing on the cushion and then legging it down the hill, kind of like. Uh, uh. I mean, I think the first time I saw it was early 90s in Yosemite, and I saw a guy with a bouldering mat. And I was like, whoa, man, that's, that's never going to catch on. Never. Who's going to walk around carrying a, carrying a pad? <laughs> but now you see people and there's no shame to be walking around with, I don't know, two great big mats. Whereas back when I, you know, even having two mats, you'd think, oh, man, that's a bit pussy. You wouldn't do it, really. you think that's, no, you just wouldn't do it. Come on, Ash. It's so a jab at the top. Is this it? Yes, it is. That's it. it. <laughs> I'm only kidding, it's not in. <laughs> oh, this is above and beyond the kinesthetic barrier. This was a John Allen yeah. route. We started around right? on the slab here. Huh. So I think. This was probably the hardest route in Gritstone mm. at the time. And then the Messiahs around the corner of the Arete. Yeah, that looked hard. I think that was the hardest route on Gritstone for its time. That was done in the early 80s. Yeah, that, that looked hard. And then really when hard. I did this, I think that was the hardest route on Gritstone. <laughs> so at some point, and probably Goliath was one of the hardest. Yeah. So for a tiny... Tiny block. Tiny block which looks like nothing. <laughs> Yeah, like decades it's got of an amazing, route. It's got an amazing history. Yeah. Come on. Come on. I would say with my climbing, my weakness, funny enough, was power. So my strength was always endurance. I was always good on endurance routes. Uh, my own sighting, um, you know, I was always really good on endurance. So I wanted to work on my bouldering. So I just worked so hard on my power because that was my weakness. I think for both of us really, our climbing excelled a lot when we got into bouldering because then we were certainly strong enough to do the moves that you need to do. In, when I was 19, I organized to, go, to have a trip to go to America. And the two hardest routes in the world at the time were two routes called Psycho and Genesis. And uh, I really wanted to do those routes. And Psycho's an overhang. Uh, and with living at Tom's roof, I just spent the whole summer just bouldering and doing all these eliminate boulder problems. And I just did loads and loads of bouldering because I was convinced that that would make me strong and I did all these eliminate things and stuff like that. And everybody thought I was crazy because everybody just went off and did roots all day and I just stayed there and I was just beaving around doing all these uh, little problems in this scruffy, dirty crag right next to the road.
<laughs> That's the wor wor world's first dual texture hold. And then I went to America and I was just, because I was really overtrained for those things and I just, I did them really quickly. I think I did Psycho, Third Go, uh, which at the time was one of the hardest routes in the world. Everybody tried it and not done it. And I was just like, well, it's like stone it just went <laughs> way easier than the problems I've been doing. People didn't, people didn't boulder to train. People really didn't do that. All they did was top rope routes. So we went to Stony Middleton, we put a top rope on Wee Doris, and then we just did continual laps on, on Wee Doris. And then there was a climber called Pete O'Donovan who was, had been to America, and he was really up on training. And he talked about rest days, and I was like, right, I'd never heard of rest days. It was a new concept. And I remember him saying that he did pull-ups and you think that pull-ups would help for climbing. And I was like, wow, do you think, you know, pull-ups would help for climbing? That's an amazing concept. So that winter, I thought, well, I'm just gonna try it and see if it helps. So I just spent the whole winter at the Polytechnic gym and we just did endless pull-ups on finger edges. And then I went back to Stony Milton at the beginning of the year uh, in springtime when it dried off and I just absolutely floated up it. And that's when I realized that training helped for climbing and then I was, really sort of in, into training. When we built this wall, never, never, never in a million years did you think people would only climb inside. Everything was designed to climb here to go outside. And the first week we opened, it rained every day and nobody came in. And then you just, and then I thought we, we've wasted our money. Nobody's gonna pay to climb indoors. It's just not gonna happen. Not with the Peak District there. I think now people start climbing and they go to the indoor gyms and the indoor gyms are really, really good. Um, but I'd wish for more of the younger climbers starting today to be attracted to this kind of adventure side mm -hmm. of climbing. Even though many, many people just climb indoors, then there's so much to explore. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a really big effort. I would always, in my head, I would always say that the technical part is even more important than the physical part. And that's kind of what we wanted to display, especially in the second book, because the first book is more of the theoretical framework for technique, for physical training, for mental training. But the second book is just a collection of exercises. We wanted most of the exercises to be on the wall, because I think if you can train specific strength on the wall, you'll become a better climber while doing it, so you're actually training both technique and strength at the same time. If you want to be a good climber, you have to climb a lot, and you need to figure out like the problem solving that Martin discussed, how to move on rock, and, and to understand that the best climbers doesn't necessarily just pull harder, they pull better on the holes because they position themselves better. For me, I think the most important thing is variety and changing where you climb and, and climbing on different rock types. So for me, I learned a huge amount climbing on granite and climbing in Joshua Tree. I mean, I was climbing pretty good and I went there and I, I could not do a 5'9 slab. 
I couldn't do like a RBS. I mean, it was just so alien and with no handholds and, and that really helped my climbing massively. If you can't travel, then just try and go on different rock types. And even if it doesn't feel like it's helping you, it will be. You know, if you climb on, if you only want to climb on climbing walls and climbing doors, climb on loads of different climbing walls. You know, go to lots of different ones, so, so it varies. It's all to do with shocking the system, so your body doesn't get used to like, to something, so it's all, all the time having to adapt. You have to sort of embrace the variation that climbing gives. So even though if you're a comp climber, then you have to work specifically for the comps. Like you do moves on the comp circuit that you will almost never encounter outdoors. But there's a lot of value in going out and doing something completely different. Like n no moves are the same, but there are similarities between them. For your comp climbers to go grit climbing would probably be very beneficial from time to time because you stand on worse holds, you hold on to worse holds than what you do on the comp circuit and you, you learn movements, you learn body positions and then you can apply that in, in some other setting when you're comp climbing. And I would also be inclined to say that maybe the mental part kind of trumps them all. For me, when I was climbing, I never had any problem ever red pointing or bouldering. It was very different when I started doing competitions. And competitions were completely out of my comfort zone. It really threw me and got to me and I really underperformed and I didn't know how to do it. And because I was climbing so badly, I thought, well, it, there's no point in getting stronger. There's no point in doing more on sites. There's no point in doing dieting, anything. I need to find out what's happening in my head. And Mastermind, it's not just what I say, it's what other people say. I interviewed what I thought are the current best climbers in the world and asked them, what do you think makes you special? Why do you think you win more than other people? What mind frame are you in when, when you do your best? What do you think about before competitions? And some of the stuff in there is just so powerful in just a few paragraphs of what people say and what they think. Enjoyment part uh, sort of gets corrupted sometimes by the performance part. If you get so too much into like the, the gradings and uh, to do that route or that boulder and the comparison, it can sort of like drain you if you compare yourself to others all the time, like he did it or she did it in that amount of tries and I should do that. It can still be a really good day uh, even though you don't achieve anything. It can be a very good day if your friend does something that you can't do. So like to find the enjoyment in that. And I think that translates into the enjoyment for training for climbing as well. It's, for me at least. <laughs>